All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Nicole Parellada. I am one of the chief medical residents, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to today's Grand Rounds. Um, today we have for you Dr. Munoz Mendoza and Dr. Venucopo. Um, Dr. Munoz Mendoza ha, uh, received his medical degree from the University Na Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos de Lima, Peru. He completed internal medicine residency at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia and fellowship in nephrology at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. After completing fellowship, he joined the faculty at the University of Miami, Katz Family Division of Nephrology and Hypertension in 2011. Uh, Dr. Munoz Mendoza is currently an associate professor of clinical medicine. He is currently the medical director of DaVita Miami campus, our main inpatient um, outpatient dialysis unit. His research interests include the relationships between the non-neoplastic histopathological features and um, kidney function in patients undergoing nephrectomy and cardiovascular disease in patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, please welcome me, uh, help me in welcoming Dr. Munoz Mendoza. Thank you very much for kind introduction. I'm gonna to talk today about updates in nephrology. I have no disclosures. And these are the objectives of my presentation. We'll uh, first try to evaluate the effects of HGL2 inhibitors in patients with CKD. Specifically, I will review the kidney, uh, the MPA kidney study. I will also review the role of GLP-1 receptor agonists in patients with diabetic kidney disease. And finally, I'll review the role of thiazide diuretics on the management of hypertension in advanced CKD. In terms of the HGL2 inhibitors and renal outcomes, this is the study I'm going to review, the study of the heart and kidney protection with empaglifosine. This study includes close to 7,000 patients with or without diabetes and with an EGFR in between 20 to 45, regardless of the level of albumin, albuminuria, or an EGFR in between 45 to 90 with an urine albumin to creatinine ratio greater than 200 milligrams per gram. This study excluded patients with type 1 diabetes, ESRD, or kidney transplantation, and history of ADPKD. They randomized to either empaglifosine 10 milligrams once daily compared to placebo. This trial was stopped early for efficacy at a median follow-up of two years. These are the baseline characteristics of this study. Close to 50% uh, were diabetics, and a quarter of the patients had cardiovascular disease. The mean EGFR was 37 ml per minute, and a third of the patients had a um, GFR less than 30 ml per minute. The median urine albumin to creatinine ratio was around 330. And the, uh, uh, around 20% of patients had a urine albumin to creatinine uh, ratio uh, less than 30. Um, majority of the patients were on ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and these uh, were well distributed uh, uh, across both groups in the empaglifosine or placebo group. These are the primary outcome um, in this study. It's the progression of kidney disease or death from cardiovascular causes. You'll see here on the, on, on the uh, figure that uh, the hazard ratio of failure and paglifosine compared to placebo, and the hazard ratio was 0 0.72. Uh, 432 patients developed an event which corresponds to 13% in the empaglifosine group here in orange compared to 558, which corresponds to 17% in the placebo group. This translates into a relative risk reduction of 28%, an absolute risk reduction of 3.6%, and a number necessary to treat of 28 patients to uh, uh, save an event. When we looked at the uh, secondary outcome, in this case, progression of kidney disease, the results were very similar. You'll see here that um, the um, hazard ratio was 0 0.71, favoring empaglifosine compared uh, to uh, placebo. <laughs> If we looked at the primary outcome in key pre-specified subgroups of patients, we'll see here that results were uh, favoring empaglifosine in patients with diabetes or without diabetes. Of course, it was stronger in patients with diabetes, but it still was significantly in patients without diabetes. It was uh, benefit uh, better with empaglifosine according to different categories of EGFR. You'll see here in between less than 30, 30 to 45, or more than 45, they all uh, um, favor empaglifosine. And in this particular group, in group of urine albumin to creatinine ratio, you'll see here the ones who have more than 300 milligrams per gram, the results strongly favor empaglifosine. But in the other two categories, when you have a UACR less than 30 or in between 30 to 60, the results were not statistically significant. 
when we looked at the change from baseline uh, in the eGFR, you'll see here in orange that originally the uh, GFR declined a little bit in the empaglifosin group, but overall the slope was a slower decline over time compared to placebo. In the empaglifosin uh, group was uh, in orange, you have 1.37 mLs per minute per year compared to placebo that was minus 275 mLs per minute per year with an estimated treatment difference of 137 mLs per minute per year favoring uh, uh, empaglifosin. Now, these are safe drugs that have been used uh, for many years now. And you see here, there was some side effects that we had to be aware of, and they were, they were present equally in both groups and in less than 4% of patients. You have here UTIs, hyperkalemia, AKIs, bone fractures, severe hypoglycemia. One uh, that was uh, different in, in, in the empaglifosin group was the presence of ketoacidosis. Six patients had ketoacidosis in the empaglifosin group compared to one in placebo, and that was statistically significant different. Although in numbers, uh, it, 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 it wasn't that uh, high of a number. These are the prior studies in HGL2 inhibitors uh, and, and renal outcomes that have been uh, published in the literature. The um, prior uh, study, uh, uh, credence study, uh, only included patients with type 2 diabetes, and the DAPA CKD included patients with with or without diabetes, like in the present study, but with a higher cutoff or GFR. In this case, it was 7, 25 to 75, and a UACR of 200 to 5,000. In the credence study, the, res, the hazard ratio favoring canaglifosin was 0.70, uh, and this is statistically significant. And similarly, in the DAPA CKD, the hazard ratio was 0.61 favoring DAPA glyphosin compared to placebo. So very consistent results across the uh, different drugs from the same category. Now, just to contrast this to the prior uh, drugs that we've been using for many years now, I want to show you the results of the renal study and the IDNT study. These are studies that tested ARVs in type 2 diabetes compared to placebo. And you'll see here that the risk re reduction um, in uh, favoring losartan compared to placebo was 16%. That's, uh, uh, in, that study was published in 2001. And the IDNT study that uh, tested uh, irvesartan compared to amlodipine or placebo. In this study, the uh, risk reduction was 20% for renal outcomes uh, compared to either amlodipine or irvesartan. So now we do have these drugs, and this is just a cartoon of a typical patient that was enrolled in one of these clinical trials. And you'll see here, that's just uh, an example of how it, uh, uh, this drug will help our patient. If you have a patient who was placed on ACE inhibitors with a, let's say a median age of 63 and a GFR of 56, the uh, uh, expected decline of GFR would be around 4.6 mLs per minute in a year. So in 10 years, he will end that dialysis. But on top of that, you added, on top of the ARBs, you add an HGL2 inhibitors. This will add around 15 years freedom from ESKD. So these are uh, important drugs that now we have in our environment study. In the in base of these studies, the KDGO guidelines uh, recommend treating patients with type 2 diabetes, CKD, and an EGFR more than 20 with an HGL2 inhibitors with strain of evidence 1A. They also recommend treating adults with CKD and heart failure or GFR more than 20 with a urine albumin to creatinine ratio more than 200 with an HGL2 inhibitors. It's a strain of recommendation 1A. And they suggest less strong recommendation treating adults with an EGFR more than 20 to 45 with a urine albumin to creatinine ratio uh, less than 200 with an HGL2 inhibitor. Strength of recommendation to be. These are actually from the uh, public review draft that was uh, published in July, and it's, it's soon they're going to come the final recommendations. The GLP1 uh, receptor agonist in diabetic kidney disease, that's the second part of the presentation. Uh, it's important to mention that the cardiovascular benefits of GLP1 are well established in patients with type 2 diabetes and elevated atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk, including patients with diabetic kidney disease. And that's been shown consistently in different studies. This is just a meta-analysis showing the GLP-1 for prevention of MACE. And you'll see here the hazard ratio 0.86 favoring GLP-1 compared to placebo in, in this meta-analysis published in 2021. Now, these are studies, cardiovascular uh, outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes. Now, the, some of the uh, secondary outcomes in these studies uh, uh, looked at renal outcomes. And this is an, uh, the, the meta-analysis evaluating the composite kidney outcome, including macroalbuminuria. And again, you'll see a clear benefit of uh, GLP-1 of, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.79, favoring uh, GLP-1 compared to placebo. Now, when we exclude the uh, macroalbuminuria as part of the composite uh, kidney outcome, and we look only worsening of kidney function, 
from there's a trend now to improvement uh, um, uh, outcomes with a hazard ratio of 0 0.86, but the results were not statistically significant anymore. Now remember, these are patients who are from the general uh, population with uh, diabetes, but many of those, they don't have kidney disease or they do have just early kidney disease. So the most prominent risk in, at this moment is usually albuminuria. So what we have now, uh, exploratory or post-hoc analysis, uh, evaluating renal outcomes in these patients. Uh, I'm just gonna review a couple of these studies and, and I'm gonna mention one of the few, one of the latest studies that uh, has uh, published results. The, uh, this is a post-hoc analysis of the Sustain6 and Pioneer6 trials uh, that evaluated semaglutide versus placebo. This is a pool analysis of more than 6,000 patients. The Sustain6 evaluated once weekly subcutaneous semaglutide, and the Pioneer6 evaluated once daily oral semaglutide compared to placebo in both, both studies. The outcomes was annual change in GFR. This study included patients with a mean EGFR of 75, and uh, but they did have some patients with an EGFR in between 30 to 60, in this case, 24% and 60% of the patients had an UACR less than 30. So usually early stages of CKD or not CKD. And this is the main results of this uh, postdoc analysis. You'll see here that the EGFR on the left kind of stabilized, didn't really decline in patients uh, that were taking uh, uh, semaglutide, but you'll see a clear decline in patients who were using uh, insulin. And the, uh, in the right, you'll have the bar graphs that show an estimated treatment difference in between semaglutide compared to placebo of 1.06 mLs per minute per year, which was uh, uh, statistically significant. This is another study I want to call to your attention. This is the AWARD-7. It's a study of safety and efficacy, testing dulaglutide versus insulin in patients with type 2 diabetes and moderate to severe CKD. The follow-up of this study was 52 weeks. They included around 600 patients with type 2 diabetes and CKD stage 3 to 4. These are kind of this, uh, our patient population of renal, renal patients. We randomized them at higher dose, lower dose of dulaglutide or insulin, and the outcomes were changing hemoglobin, changing EGFR, or changing ua galvin to gratin ratio. This study has this, the mean GFR of these patients was around 38 with lower GFR, and uh, close to 50% had a UACR more than 300. So they did have diabetic kidney disease. And these are the results you'll see here in green, the insulin declined significantly in patients who were in, in, in insulin, uh, and as opposed to in the other two groups of uh, dulaglutide higher or lower dose, the GFR declined less uh, compared to, um, to insulin. And, and this and gar, uh, these graphs on the right, you'll see here, either those who do lot of die kind of stabilize the GFR and you'll see a significant drop in GFR in, the, in, in patients with diabetes at 26 weeks and, and 52 weeks in patients randomized to uh, insulin. This is an exploratory analysis. We, we can't really uh, conclude, but this is a, a hypothesis generating uh, of the uh, AWARD-7 uh, study and they evaluated a composite kidney outcome by treatment group in this case, the composite outcome was for more than 40% decline in EGFR or ESKD or death due to kidney disease. You'll see here the events happen in 10.8% of patients in the insulin group compared to only 5.2% in the patients in the high dose dulaglutide, with a hazard ratio in this case of 0.45. Uh, impressive results. And now, if you uh, evaluate the same outcome in patients in the subgroup, the patients who had macroalbuminuria, so then the results are even much more impressive. You'll see here an event rate of 22% in the insulin uh, group compared to only 7.1% in the dulaglutide high dose with an impressive hazard ratio of 0 0.25. Um, but what about the dual increditing agonists, GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonists? Well, we do have some uh, post-hoc analysis in this group of uh, drugs as well. And I'm going to show you just one, the tirsepatide versus insulin glargine on kidney outcomes in type 2 diabetes. This is a post-hoc analysis of the SURPASS-4 trial. This SURPASS-4 trial is a randomized open-label parallel group phase 3 study that included around 3,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, and, uh, BMI more than 25, and established cardiovascular or high risk of cardiovascular events. They randomized either to tirsepatide, different doses, or insulin uh, glargine. The treatment median duration of this study was 85 weeks. Remember, these studies included patients with a mean GFR of 81%, uh, 63% had a urine albuminuria gratis less than 30, so usually not severe CKD. And a majority of them were on ACE inhibitors or ARB, and the SGL2 inhibitor was 25% uh, of patients were taking already ACE inhibitors. This is the uh, main renal composite endpoint uh, in this uh, um, postdoc analysis. They define uh, the outcome as decreasing GFR more than 40%, renal death or ESKD, and new onset macroalbuminuria, 
And you'll see here clearly that uh, the results favor uh, tirsepatide in blue compared to uh, insulin glargine with a hazard ratio of 0 0.58. Now, this was driven mainly for macroalbuminuria. You'll see here when in the right, when you take away as part of the composite atom of macroalbuminuria, so the, the, the study is not safe significant anymore. Now, if you see the, the GFR decline, uh, you'll see here the slower decline of GFR with tirsepatide in blue compared to insulin glargine. And if you see change in urine albumin to creatin ratio, very much there was no change in tirsepatide in the UACR, but increasing over time in uh, patients on insulin. So what about the studies on GLP-1 to reduce heart killing outcomes such as EGFR decline, progression of ESKD, or death from kidney causes in patients with CKD? So we do have uh, one study that uh, um, uh, the results were actually announced yesterday. Um, this is a kidney outcome trial with once weekly semaglutide in people with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. This is actually a similar renal outcome trial in patients with kidney disease and diabetes. And, and this is kind of the uh, summary of the study. They, this study enrolled patients with type 2 diabetes with an EGFR in between 50 to 75 and a urine albumin to creatinine ratio in between 300 to 5,000, or an EGFR in between 25 to 50 and a UACR in between 100 to 5,000. The composite primary endpoint this time was time to uh, first occurrence of kidney failure, which was defined as GFR less than 15 or the initiation of renal replacement therapy, persistent decline in, in GFR more than 50% or death from kidney or cardiovascular causes. So these are similar outcomes to the ones that they were reported in the SGL2 inhibitor trial. And they randomized to either uh, placebo, um, excuse me, placebo versus semaglutide. Uh, they started with 0 0.25 and then went up to one milligram once weekly. Um, the baseline characteristics of this study were already reported, and 68% uh, 60, were a high risk for progression of CKD, and the median EGF, the, the median EGFR was uh, 47 mLs per minute, and the median UACR was 568 mLs, uh, milligrams per gram. Um, remember, they include patients with type 2, the mean age was around 66 years, and the mean diabetic uh, duration was 17.4 years, so long-standing diabetes. The mean hemoglobin A1C was 7.8 and 15.5% of these patients were receiving an AGL2 inhibitor already. This study in October 10 was stopped uh, early for efficacy based on a recommendation of the Independent Data Monitoring Committee. And yesterday, the company actually announced in a press release that semaglutide one milligram demonstrated 24% reduction in the risk of kidney disease-related events in people with type 2 diabetic and chronic kidney disease in the flow trial. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have the study yet. It hasn't been published in, in large, but uh, uh, this is a, these are encouraging and data for our patients. Finally, I will switch gears and I'll talk about TSI diuretics in the management of hypertension in patients with advanced CKD. Remember that the prevailing dogma is that TSI diuretics are ineffective in CKD, specifically when the GFR falls below 30. And that's what's been commonly uh, taught in, in our uh, medical schools. The clortalidone, and this is a trial that tried to kind of uh, change that, uh, that uh, belief. The clortalidone in chloric kidney disease uh, trial, the CLIC trial, enrolled patients, uh, 160 patients. This is a hypertensive trial. This is not uh, with big numbers like I showed in the other studies uh, uh, that I mentioned previously. And they uh, evaluated that it's a, this is a 12-week double-blind random mouse control trial testing clortalidone compared to placebo the, uh, in patients with advanced CKD and purely controlled hypertension. So this is the inclusion criteria, EGFR in between 15 to 30, uncontrolled hypertension defined as a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure measurement, more than 130 or more than 80, uh, and treatment with an ACE inhibitor, ARB, or beta blocker. The exclusion criteria, 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure measurements, more than 160 uh, or over 100, and history stroke or MI hospitalization for heart failure in the last uh, three months before, uh, uh, before uh, enrolling. High dose furosemide, more than 200 milligrams per day, or uh, use of thiazide or thiazide like diuretics in the last 12 weeks. This is uh, how they uh, did the study design. They randomized uh, to uh, clotalidone versus placebo. They started with a low dose, 12.5 milligrams, and every four weeks they titrated up according to the blood pressure levels, and they went up to 50 milligrams. But the mean dose that they needed to achieve uh, blood pressure control at, two week, at 12 weeks was 23. 0.1 milligrams in the clotalidin group and, and 37.2 in the placebo group. So the primary outcome of the study, um, there was a change in 24-hour ambulatory systolic blood pressure from baseline to 12 weeks, and the secondary outcome was changed from baseline to 12 weeks in urine albumin to gratin ratio. 
These are the baseline characteristics. Um, 66 years in average, 40% were black. Patients, diabetes mellitus, diabetes mellitus was present in 74% in the clotaline group and 77 in the placebo group. 3.4 uh, number of antipertensive drugs in each group. Similarly, almost 60% were in loop diuretics and it was in, the, in both groups. The EGFR uh, mean was 23.5 and the clotalidone versus 22.8 in the placebo group and the median UACR was around 800 milligrams per gram. More than, um, uh, more than 60% had an UACR more than 300. And the median urinary sodium excretion measured in 24 hour uh, urine was 100, around 100 millimoles, which means that this patient was really a low salt diet. These are the main results. In the left, you see the 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure. In the placebo group, there was only a decline of 0 0.5, and the clotalidone group was a decline of 11 millimeters of mercury, <clears throat> with a mean difference uh, uh, of 10.5 millimeters of mercury in red, favoring clotalidone compared to placebo. In terms of seated systolic blood pressure, the, um, the clotalidone uh, group had a 12.6 millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure and a difference compared to placebo of 15.1 millimeters of mercury, both statistically significant. <clears throat> now, if, you, if we follow it, the, um, uh, how, how this happened over time, you'll see here that the effect of clotalidone was noticed already at four weeks, and, and this persisted at 12 weeks, and actually even after this continuation of the drugs at 14 weeks. When we looked at the UACR, You'll see here that there was an effect of um, clotalidone uh, red, uh, in reduction of albuminuria that started at four weeks, and at 12 weeks, there was a 50% decline in UACR compared to uh, in, in clotalidone group compared to placebo. And there are side, side effects that we had to uh, be aware of this, uh, no, mostly electrolytes and normality, uh, hypomagnesemia, hypercalcemia, hyperglycemia, hyperuricemia, all of these were more prominent in patients taking time size. So these are drugs that we had to use with cautious, and mostly they the AKI, there was significant amount of patients who developed AKI, but when they looked at uh, more uh, carefully, the patients who developed AKI was actually those who were already on loop diuretics, much higher presence of AKI in the, the patients who were on loop diuretics compared to the ones who were not on loop diuretics. So in summary, this trial, um, in patients with CKD stage four and poorly controlled hypertension, a mean number of 3.4 antihypertensive drugs, Clortalidone reduces systolic blood pressure about 10 millimeters of mercury within four weeks, which persists at 12 weeks. There is a reduction in ERCR by 50% that suggests kidney protection, and the episode of AKI is more likely in patients on loop diuretics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yair, for that very didactic lecture, very clear slides, and nice summary of some complicated trials. I wonder if I could just ask you, can you give us any insight into the mechanism of action as to how some of these drugs work? Maybe not so much the GLP-1 and GIP drugs because maybe it's obesity, maybe it's diabetes, but it's certainly in the SGLT, SGLT inhibitors, the, half of them didn't even have diabetes to begin with. So what is the mechanism of action that uh, allows these drugs to have such a positive effect on uh failure to progress to kidney failure? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the answer to that question, I think is still unknown. Uh, in terms of the GFR, uh, specifically the, the GFR protection, we, we think this related to some, uh, in some way, to the feedback mechanism of the tubular glomerular feedback. But the cardiovascular um, uh, results, uh, I think, is still the output debate. We don't still don't have a clear idea what it is. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you again, Dr. Munoz Mendoza. Um, up next, we have Dr. Venukopal. Uh, she uh, completed her medical education in India, uh, followed by internal medicine residency at the Montefiore Medical Center in New York. Uh, she then completed hematology and oncology fellowship at the Tisch Center, uh, Tisch Cancer Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, also in New York. Additionally, she completed an advanced leukemia fellowship at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, as well as a master's in clinical research at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., 
She is keenly interested in myeloid malignancy research and in particular early phase clinical development of novel and rationally targeted uh, therapies. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Renegopal. Hi, thank you for the kind introduction. My talk is divided into three aspects to outline the evolution of clonal cytopenia of undetermined significance, aka CCUS, to MDS, and to classify MDS to appropriate prognostic subgroups for risk-adapted treatment, and to determine the most appropriate treatment strategy based on risk stratification. So let's start with the case vignette. So Mr. J, initially presented with incidental thrombocytopenia in 2006 when he was in his 60s. So at that time, his platelet count was 102 and he was serially followed. And in 2008, his platelet count was found to be 96, at which time he was referred to a hematologist. There were no pertinent positive history or findings. And in 2009, the hematologist decided to do a bone marrow biopsy, and the bone marrow biopsy showed a mildly increased cellularity. There was no dysplasia noted, and the blast count was 0%. Patient had a normal karyotype, and there were no mutations. So what does he have? If we look at this picture in 2008, to nine, he would have ICUS, which is cytopenia of undetermined significance, as he didn't have any clonality as evidenced by his normal karyotype and no mutations and no dysplasia. And the only thing that he had was cytopenia. So in 2017, when he was serially followed, his platelet count dropped to 80, at which time he underwent a second bone marrow biopsy, at which time the cellularity was 22%. He had a dysplasia of 2%. So 2% dysplasia is considered to be normal. Say less than 10% is considered to be normal and 10% or greater is abnormal. And his blast count was 0% and he had a normal karyotype. His mutations included ASXL1 with a variant allele frequency of 20%, SRSF2 at 22% and EZH2 32%. So in 2017, if we look at this pictogram, what does he have? He has CCUS or clonal cytopenia, which shows that it, he has clonality and cytopenia. He doesn't have dysplasia. As we can see, this triangle shows the incremental risk of progression in general population to MDS with regards to ICUS clonal hematopoiesis, and CCUS. Now that we know this patient has CCUS, now we have to know what risk he has, whether this is low risk or high risk. So this is a study that was done by our Italian colleagues in 2017, where they looked at 600 plus patients with cytopenias with and without mutations to evaluate the predictive risk of somatic mutations and evolution of myeloid neoplasm. The figure A shows the cumulative probability of evolution of a myeloid neoplasm in all patients. The figure B shows the cumulative, this is in terms of number of mutations, so the cumulative probability of evolution of a myeloid neoplasm in patients with respect to the number of mutations. As we can see, the risk of evolution to a myeloid neoplasm progress is directly proportional to the number of mutations. And the figure C shows the cumulative probability of evolution in patients with and without somatic mutations, meaning, so without somatic mutations, that is ICUS, idiopathic cytopenia of undetermined significance, as shown by the blue line, and the red line is CCUS, which is clonal cytopenia of undetermined significance, which includes the mutations. Now that they found out the CCUS folks have a higher risk of evolution to a myeloid neoplasm, 
they look they wanted to look at patients who are at lower risk of developing a myeloid among the subgroup of patients with CCAS who are at a lower risk of developing a myeloid neoplasm as opposed to a higher risk. So what they did find was patients who had two or more mutations and BAF greater than 8.7% or mutations in the spliceosome complex or co-mutation patterns involving the TET2, ASXL1, or DNMT3A, and mutations such as RANX1, EZH2, et cetera, are at a higher risk of um, CCUS. So after they found this out, they wanted to see what is the cumulative probability of evolution with respect to the mutation pattern. So the green line is represents the high-risk CCUS. As you can see, the risk of evolution of uh, to a myeloid neoplasm is higher with the high-risk CCUS, and the middle one, which is shown by the red, is the low-risk CCUS, and the blue one, which is flat line, is the ICUS, which means they have, it's just an idiopathic cytopenia without chronality. Now, if we go back to our patient, what would you call our patient as? So they have um, three mutations, and their VAF is greater than 10%, and they have these uh, mutation in the ASXL1, SRSF2, which is a spliceosome complex, and EZH2. What would you call our patient? Anyone? It's high risk CCUS. So now he was really he was in that position for about four years. And in 2021, the patient presented to the ER with a new onset of shortness of breath and greatly decreased exercise tolerance. And the labs done at that time showed a hemoglobin of 4.9 and platelets were at 96 and erythropoietin levels were 140. They decided to do a bone marrow biopsy and this is the bone marrow biopsy. So at which time that in 2021, the cellularity was 47%, which is hypercellular marrow and dysplasia was 10%, so the dysplasia is abnormal, and he had a blast count of 1%, and the karyotype continued to be normal. And for the mutation profile, in addition to the previous mutations, three mutations he had, he also gained another one, which is SF3B1 at a VAF of 65%. The figure shows, this is a, um, this is a cross-section of the bone marrow biopsy, and this picture shows the iron-laden mitochondria of the erythroblast. This is a ring sideroblast uh, with Prussian blue staining, and the, it's, the iron-laden mitochondria is shown as the perinuclear rings, blue rings here. So pathologists confirmed the diagnosis as MDS. So MDS, so we are done with the first aspect of the talk, which is outlining the CCUS to MDS. So MDS is a hematological malignancy, and the median, median age of diagnosis is 70 years. I like to uh, categorize, uh, not I like, the. we like to categorize MDS into lower and higher risk disease based on the risk of leukemic transformation and overall survival. Patients with lower risk MDS suffer from low blood counts, the need for transfusions, and the resultant poor quality of life. Higher risk MD, in higher risk MDS, it's associated, higher risk MDS is associated with increased risk of transformation to AML and decreased overall survival. When we manage patients with MDS, we use a risk adapted approach, which, um, which is dichotomous because the lower risk patients live longer. So we aim to ameliorate the cytopenias and higher risk MDS patients are at risk of AML. So we want to prevent AML transformation. I like to consider MDS risk stratification to Laplace demon because um, we essentially plug the variables into the risk stratification and the risk stratification kind of spits out the leukemia-free survival, overall survival, and the risk of AML transformation. So we have two risk stratifications. One is IPSSR, our revised international prognostic score system, which was piloted in 2012. And the other one is molecular international prognostic score system, or IPSSM, which was piloted in 2022. So IPSSR has a number of variables, which incorporates the percentage of bone marrow blasts 
and the cytogenetic abnormalities, and each one has a different score, a hemoglobin concentration, and platelet count, and the absolute neutrophil count, or we, uh, as, as regards to the depth of cytopenias. So based on the score, they are categorized into very low, low, intermediate, high, and very high risk based on the, uh, depending on their risk of transformation to AML. And IPSSR score of 3.5 effectively discriminates MDS patients into a lower risk MDS patient as opposed to a higher risk MDS patients. So this was evaluated in about 7,000 and plus patients. It was a massive international effort. And now that 10 years passed, we have the next generation sequencing. So we are we want to know what is the effect of mutations in with respect to the risk stratification. So this is again a massive international effort, which uh, which included about 2,900 2, patients. And they incorporated the IPSSR variables along with 31 somatic gene mutations to arrive at the IPSSM score. So these are some of the mutations that are uh, that we include uh, to predict the risk of leukemia-free survival and the risk of AML transformation and the overall survival. In particular, we look at the TP53 multi-hit status, meaning if the TP53 this is very important to discriminate if the patient is a higher risk as opposed to a lower risk. And IPSSR does not take into account the molecular risk factors. So what's our patient risk? So this is the uh, website. They, we have, they have an iPhone app too. So we kind of like to do it in the clinic along with the patient, plugging in the variables and to see and ask them, do you want to know what is your median overall survival? And if they say yes, and we do this exercise. So our patient, according to the IPSSR score, he is a low risk MDS patient. If I plug in and plug all his mutations, especially his four mutations, into the IPSSM score, it is high risk MDS. So when in the study with the IPSSM, what they did was when they restratified patients from the IPSSR subgroup, about 46% of the patients from IPSSR were restratified by the IPSSM, in which about 75% of the patients were upgraded to a higher risk score as shown by the figure below. And about 25% of the patients were downgraded to a lower risk score. So for context, for especially with relation to treatment, we almost we always use the IPSSR score to determine if the patient has if the patient needs treatment for a lower risk or uh, if they need treatment for a higher risk MDS. That's mainly because next generation sequencing is not widely available in most centers. I must clarify community centers. So this is a simple flowchart which shows a risk adapted treatment strategy for MDS. I'm going to talk about lower risk MDS in a minute. And for higher risk MDS, hypomethylating agents, namely azacitidine or decidabine, remains the treatment of choice. And with regards to targeted therapy, ivocidinib, an inhibitor of IDH1 mutant enzyme, is approved in IDH1 mutated MDS in patients who are relapsed or refractory to hypomethylating agents. So coming to lower risk MDS, patients can present with anemia or thrombocytopenia or neutropenia. For, any, for thrombocytopenia and neutropenia, we do not have effective therapies in MDS. We just use growth factors as and when needed or transfusions. Anemia is the most common cytopenia in lower risk MDS. It's often progressive leading to red blood cell transfusion dependence. When we look at lower risk MDS with anemia, with transfusion dependent anemia, we kind of uh, divide them into patients with DEL5 Q cytogenetic abnormality and those who are, have non DEL5 Q cytogenetic abnormality. So, lenalidomide is approved in lower risk transfusion dependent MDS with DEL5 Q cytogenetic abnormality. In non DEL5 Q setting, until August 28th of 2023, erythropoiesis stimulating agents were first line and loose padacept was approved in the second line in lower risk transfusion dependent MDS patients with ringed sideroblasts. On August 28th of 2023, loose padacept was approved in treatment naive lower risk transfusion dependent MDS patients. 
So if we look at this, our patient was diagnosed in 2021 and his erythropoietin level was 140, in which case he would have received erythropoietin, recombinant erythropoietin as a first line treatment because we, from several studies, we know that erythropoietin levels lower than 500 predict, is, uh, predict a good response to recombinant erythropoietin. So he would have received recombinant erythropoietin and say, for example, in 2022, if he lost the response, then they would have probably switched him to loose padacept in second line setting. Now let's look at the data behind these recommendations. So what is loose padacept? So loose padacept is an erythrocyte maturation agent. It is an active in ligand trap, which acts on the late stages of erythropoiesis uh, to treat ineffective erythropoiesis. So it binds to GDF11, which is a negative regulator of late stage erythropoiesis and inhibits TGF beta signaling. So loose padacept was approved in the second line setting based on the Medalist trial. So Medalist trial was a placebo controlled phase three study evaluated in patients who were who relapsed or refractory or ineligible to uh, erythropoiesis stimulating agent and patients with MDS, lower risk MDS with ring sideroblasts were enrolled. And, no, and most importantly, these patients did not have a Del5Q cytogenetic abnormality. The cohort was randomized in a two is to one fashion and loose padacept was administered every 21 days. So the primary endpoint was red blood cell transfusion independence lasting for eight weeks or longer during weeks one to 24. And the key secondary endpoints were RBC transfusion independence lasting for 12 weeks or longer between weeks one to 24 and one to 48. And additional secondary endpoints include, included the erythroid response, which is defined as a reduction in red blood cell transfusion burden for four units or more in an eight week period, or a mean hemoglobin increase for about 1.5 gram per deciliter. So the baseline, the study enrolled about <clears throat> 229 patients and baseline characteristics were well balanced between the loose padacept and the placebo arm in terms of red blood cell transfusion burden, pre-transfusion hemoglobin, presence or absence of uh, SF3B1 mutations and the serum erythropoietin levels. As we can see, loose padacept achieved the primary endpoint with statistical significance. Loose 37.9% of patients treated with loose padacept enjoyed red blood cell transfusion independence lasting for eight weeks or longer compared to placebo, which is 13.2%. With regards to the key endpoints, we can see that the responses were durable because uh, the erythroid response between week one to 24 and week, between week one to 48, as we can clearly see that loose padacept uh, treated patients had a higher rate of erythroid response with statistical significance. So this is command study, which which is which evaluated loose padacept in the first line setting. So command study is a global phase three ran open label randomized trial. It compared this efficacy and safety of loose padacept versus erythropoietin alpha for the treatment of anemia in patients with lower risk MDS and red blood cell transfusion dependence. The key eligibility criteria, as you can see, it's lower risk MDS, non-Del5Q patients, transfusion requirements, but this does not require a ring sideroblast as an eligibility criteria. So these are all comers. And patients were stratified according to the baseline erythropoietin level, baseline RBC transfusion burden, and the ring sideroblast status. The patients were randomized between, uh, in a one-to-one -one fashion, and the loose padacept dose was started at one mg per kg and was titrated up to 1.75 and administered every 21 days. These are the study endpoints. The composite primary endpoints between week one to 24 was red blood cell transfusion independence lasting for 12 weeks or longer, along with a concurrent mean hemoglobin increase of 1.5 gram deciliter or greater. And um, there was a pre-specified interim analysis when 300 patients were en uh, enrolled and 85% of the primary endpoint data were mature. 
as you can see, when of 301 patients included in the efficacy analysis, 58.5% of the patients receiving loose padacept achieved the primary endpoint as opposed to only 31.2% of patients treated with epoitin alpha. So this is the primary endpoint according to the pre-specified subgroup analysis. And the, the dark blue bar, loose paracept is represented by the dark blue bar and epoitin alpha by the light blue bar. Loose paracept, patients treated with loose paracept achieve the primary endpoint regardless of the baseline serum erythropoietin level, regardless of the red blood cell transfusion burden, or regardless of the SF3B1 mutation status. I do want to bring your attention to the ring sideroblast status. In patients with ring sideroblast, loose paracept treated patients significant, did significantly better as opposed to those without ring sideroblast. In those without ring sideroblast, the responses were comparable, and we do not know why is that? So conclusions, suspect CCUS in a patient with unexplained cytopenia and CCUS is the harbinger of MDS. Obtain a comprehensive bone marrow biopsy evaluation with next generation sequencing for appropriate risk prognostication. And just do the exercise of risk prognostication. It is fun. And educate your patient on prognosis if they want to know. Management of patient with MDS is highly individualized depending on the risk category. Loose Padacept is approved in first line and second line setting in patients with red blood cell transfusion dependent, non-DEL 5Q, lower risk MDS. Thank you for listening. Happy to take questions. Thank you for that excellent lecture, Dr. Vera Poole. Um, I'm grateful there are only 26 letters in the English alphabet because otherwise I for sure would not have been able to keep up with all the uh, acronyms. But one thing that I'm uh, intrigued about is how you actually practically present your prognostic indicator in the clinic because I would imagine that you would need to temper whatever the iPhone tells you as to what the prognosis is with what the treatment options are and then tailor them for a particular individual. I worry, I mean, how do you handle that in, in an actual patient uh, setting? So I ask my patient if they want to know the prognosis. So well, if they say yes, then we, I have an app in my phone. So we plug their numbers, hemoglobin mutations and depth of cytopenias, whether it is hemoglobin less than 10, more than 10 or whatever. And then the iPhone actually spits out, it, uh, the IPSSM calculator does give us both, which is IPSSR and IPSSM. And it shows in a nice uh, curve, it says that, okay, median overall survival is one year. I'm just making it up yeah. or whatever. So that's how I tell them. And I say that this is median. You may fall on either side of the curve and you are in low risk MDS. And if you if your hemoglobin is say 10 and you're having a good quality of life, if you don't require transfusions, I'm just going to follow. If you need transfusions, then we need to talk about options. Okay, thank you very much. Question in the back, yes. Excellent question. So this patient Repeat was- Repeat the question because the Zoom people- Sorry, uh, the question is how long uh, is the, how long does the primary care uh, should wait before referring the patient to a hematologist when they look at abnormal counts? So when you look at abnormal counts, you first do your due diligence, see that if, the, if it is due to some kind of nutritional deficiencies or other comorbidities, and if you find that everything is normal and you can't find a good reason for your patient to have cytopenia, then you follow at least every three months. And if you see that consistently the, the counts are low and you don't have a good explanation, that's when you refer to a hematologist so that he can they can get worked up. Because in this case, between 2006 and 2008, uh, the PCP followed. I just didn't put the numbers because it's, for lack of space, but uh, the primary care physician followed for every annually. Word. There was a question about how many patients I think per year, uh, 
Yes, we don't know because I think there was a study from uh, Boston that they looked at um, just cytopenias and they did see that some of these patients had mutations after uh, after a period of time. So it's it's always good to have a patient to be looked at and if they need a bone marrow biopsy, you can get a bone marrow biopsy and have a baseline. Dr. Contreras. I mean the treatment effect. Yeah. So the treatment, uh, yeah. The, so the treatment effect, especially with lower risk MDS, is aimed at aimed at uh, looking at the cytopenias, meaning the improvement of cytopenias. But if you ask me, if there is a clonal evolution while this patient was on this particular in the bone marrow. So far, it has not been shown because it's an erythropoiesis maturation agent, and it has not known to affect other counts. It's only it only affects the red blood cell count, and which improves the red blood cell count. Other counts are absolutely normal. But maybe to follow up on that question, did the uh, natural history of this, even with the treatment of the drug, show further increase in the number of different mutations in the yes. bone marrow? It is the natural history of the disease. You're absolutely correct. If if you follow someone over a period of time, and if they have like if they acquire a TP53 mutation randomly, then it pushes them into a higher risk, and then we have we may have to change the treatment. Thank you. I thank both our speakers today for excellent lectures. Please refer to the online uh, link for CME and MOC credit, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Be safe.